The graph of nuclear size, or radius, versus nuclear mass looks like the sawtooth mountains of central Idaho. This erratic pattern has been puzzling scientists for half a century. The atomic nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, but to solve this puzzle, we will recruit the smallest building block of the atomic nucleus, the quark. Protons and neutrons have three each. We will present simple geometric structures for light nuclei that are based on average quark positions and show how the stability of these light nuclei depends on an alternating quark arrangement. The alternating quark model offers a new framework within which to analyze both nuclear structure and stability, and perhaps provide a path forward to clean and abundant fusion power. Fusion is the power that drives the sun, and billions of dollars have been invested to bring fusion energy home to planet Earth. The fusion reaction is deceptively simple. Smaller nuclei, such as the hydrogen isotopes of deuterium and tritium, release large amounts of energy when forced to combine in nuclear fusion, along with byproducts such as helium and the neutron. The difficulty is that the atomic nucleus carries a positive charge. Like charges repel, and will only combine with the input of sufficient pressure and energy. Plentiful on the sun, but more challenging here on Earth. On the upside, fusion fuel is abundant. The amount of deuterium flushed down an average toilet in one day could produce enough fusion energy to meet the needs of a household for a year. On the downside, there are currently no commercial fusion reactors, although nuclear fission has been producing electricity for half a century. Nuclear fission is the opposite of nuclear fusion. Fission releases energy from the splitting of the atom. The mechanism is well understood, and there are hundreds of commercial fission reactors around the globe. Unfortunately, concerns persist about potential for reactor meltdown and radioactive waste disposal. So, while fusion is potentially a much cleaner and safer alternative, currently there are no viable fusion reactors due to the technical challenges of reproducing the extreme temperatures and pressures of the sun here on planet there may be another way. Nuclear fusion at room temperature. First reported decades ago, NASA has recently confirmed evidence of nuclear fusion at room temperature. This type of power is still decades away, however, because scientists are essentially guessing at a mechanism for how two nuclei might combine at such low temperatures. A central challenge is that we don't currently know the deeper structure of the atomic nucleus. In this NASA illustration, for example, the elements are all simply depicted as colored spheres. The deeper structures are unknown. And yet, the structure of reactants plays a major role in determining how a reaction proceeds. Imagine attempting genetic replication without knowing the structure of DNA. Unfortunately, there is currently no consensus for nuclear structure among the myriad models of the atomic nucleus, which generally avoid the smaller nuclei of interest in nuclear fusion in any case. The alternating quark model presented here offers structures for the atomic nucleus that produce radius predictions in close agreement with the measurements accepted by the scientific community. In this presentation, a deeper quark structure for the atomic nucleus will be key to a mechanism of nuclear fusion at Earth. The need for an alternating quark model arises from the light nuclear radius to mass number puzzle. For the elements above beryllium-9, the plot of nuclear size versus mass is roughly linear. We will show that this linear pattern results from the incremental addition of nucleons to a common lithium-6 base. Below lithium-7, the graph follows an erratic and puzzling sawtooth pattern. In this section, we will show that this puzzling pattern results from the unique geometries of these lighter nuclides. Current structural models of the atomic nucleus, and there are more than 30, ignore a role for quarks due to the uncertainty principle which precludes measurement of location and momentum at the scale of the atomic nucleus. 
Here we will show that accounting for average quark position within subnucleonic structure of light nuclei from hydrogen through magnesium produces 98% agreement with currently accepted radius values. The radius to mass of light nuclei is quite puzzling. The deuteron, for example, is less massive than either tritium helium-3 or helium-4, and yet its radius is somehow larger. Similarly, lithium-6 is less massive than lithium-7, but its radius is larger. Nuclear structures based on red and white spheres do not explain this puzzle. Consider the proton-deuteron relationship, for example. The radius of the proton is 0.8 femtometers, and the neutron is about the same size. One might expect that the deuteron radius would be the sum of the proton and the neutron. And there you'd be wrong. The actual radius is a puzzling 2.1 femtometers. When we present the deuteron as an alternating series of quarks, however, the resulting arithmetic is quite straightforward. The experimental radius of the deuteron is 2.1 femtometers, as mentioned previously. This equals two and a half quark to quark segments. Each segment equals the radius of the proton, 0.84 femtometers. So the deuteron radius is 2.5 times the radius of the proton. The 2.5 size ratio only applies if the quarks of each nuclide are laid out sequentially and quark to quark distance is constant. This alternating quark approach produces a 98% average fit for the lightest elements, hydrogen through magnesium. But it's not quite that simple. We must address the pink elephant in the living room, the uncertainty principle. At the scale of the atomic nucleus, the uncertainty principle does not allow determination of exact quark position and momentum. The advent of nonlinear dynamics, however, may allow postulation of an average quark position within a basin of stability, even while its exact position is uncertain. The alternating quark model presented here accurately predicts the structures of light nuclei based on these average quark positions. What we know about quarks is informed by the current paradigm, quantum chromodynamics, but this is primarily a theory of the strong nuclear force. Protons and neutrons reside in a dense nucleus and have three quarks each. Gluons bind quarks, and the residual strong force binds nucleons. The charge on quarks is known, but according to QCD, quarks play no direct role in nuclear structure. Here we present the alternating quark model, which is primarily a theory of nuclear structure. Protons and neutrons are presented in terms of their three quark constituents. Exact quark positions are uncertain, but average positions are knowable. And average quark positions assume simple geometries, such as a line or a polygon. Average quark to quark distance is constant and equals the radius of the proton. And calculated radii demonstrate 98% agreement with experimental. For example, helium-4 has 12 quarks predicting a dodecagon structure. The radius is then calculated using the formula for a regular polygon having n equal 12 sides, each side equal to a, the radius of the proton. The predicted radius is 1.63 femtometers, a 97% fit with experimental. Direct evidence of nuclear structure is sparse, however, Model-independent analysis of deep inelastic scattering experiments indicates a central depression within helium-3 and helium-4. This central depression is consistent with the proposed alternating ring structures for each. Polygon ring structures also form the basis for predicting other nuclide radii. Tritium, helium-3, and helium-4 build upon a 12-gon structure. Note that three of the 12 vertices are unoccupied for tritium and helium-3. The 18 quarks of lithium-6 occupy the vertices of an 18-gon structure. And lithium-7 is also based on an 18-gon structure, 
to which is added the three quarks of a neutron on a parallel strand. For asymmetric structures such as tritium, helium-3, and lithium-7, as well as the heavier nuclides, center of mass and axis of rotation must be considered, and the predicted radius is understood as the distance from the rotational axis to the farthest quark. Let's have a closer look at the dodecagon structures. Up and down quarks are red and green spheres, while unoccupied vertices are small white spheres. A proton is two up quarks with a down quark between, while a neutron is two down quarks with an up quark between. Thus, each quark structure may also be viewed in terms of equivalent protons and neutrons. The current quark masses may be used to calculate centers of mass, as indicated by the dot at the base of each arrow. The arrows themselves point to the farthest quark in each structure, and the predicted radius for each nucleus is the distance from the center of mass to the farthest quark. Within the alternating quark model, the nine quarks of tritium occupy nine of the twelve vertices of a dodecagon, while the remaining three are unoccupied, and this alternating quark structure yields a radius prediction of 1.88 femtometers a close approximation to the 1.76 femtometer value currently accepted by the scientific community. If we instead arrange the nine quarks of tritium along the vertices of a nine-gon or nonagon, the calculated radius of 1.23 femtometers is too small. This is one reason why linking the same type of quark is not allowed within the alternating quark model. And if we arrange the nine quarks in linear fashion, the predicted radius is too large by a factor of two. The best fit structure for tritium is thus a U-shaped structure where quarks occupy nine of the twelve vertices of a dodecagon. Similar reasoning yields the alternating quark structure of helium-3, which predicts a radius value of 1.97 femtometers. This is an identical match to the currently accepted RMS charge radius value and superior to both the nine-gon and linear geometries. Again, the best fit structure for helium-3 is a U-shaped structure, where quarks occupy nine of the twelve vertices of a dodecagon. The dodecagon is the smallest ring structure within the alternating quark model. No smaller ring structures agree with experimentally determined radii. This suggests a limitation to the degree to which any three-quark sequence may flex. The approximate limit equals the interior angle of a dodecagon, which is 150 degrees. In other words, the quark-to-quark -quark interaction has a measure of laxity. This is important in understanding the structure of the next stable nuclide, lithium-6. Lithium-6 has 18 quarks. If these 18 quarks assume a regular octadecagon geometry, the predicted radius is 2.42 femtometers. This is smaller than the accepted value of 2.59 femtometers, but quark-to-quark -quark laxity may explain the difference. The alternating quark model assumes a regular shape for lithium-6, but quark-to-quark -quark laxity would allow oscillation and vibration to distort the structure, with the long axis of vibration perhaps approximating the accepted value. Thus, the larger-than-expected radius value may be attributable to vibrational effects. In contrast, the dodecagon of helium-4 is a relatively rigid structure because quark-to-quark -quark interactions are already flexed to the 150-degree limit. This limits the extent to which the structure may vibrate and produces a more rigid structure. The dodecagon of helium-4 thus maintains a regular and rigid shape. Consequently, the predicted value of 1.63 femtometers is a closer match to the accepted value of 1.68 femtometers. The octadecagon structure of lithium-6 serves as a base upon which heavier nuclei are built. Lithium-7, for instance, has an 18-quark lithium-6 base upon which is added a neutron in the form of three additional quarks. These additional quarks associate as a parallel strand. Quarks within this strand line up with opposite quarks on the lithium-6 base and form a proton-neutron closely correlated pair. The accepted radius of lithium-7 is 2.44 femtometers. The AQM predicted radius of 2.47 femtometers assumes processional rotation. 
This prediction is a close match to the accepted value of 2.44 femtometers. If instead we arrange the 21 quarks of lithium-7 into a regular 21 gon, the predicted radius of 2.82 femtometers is too large. Here's another reason why same quark linkages are not allowed within the alternating quark model. The size of a macroscopic object such as a baseball can be measured directly. We could make the same measurement using a flashlight and measuring the shadow. Dividing by two yields the radius. This is a lot of work for a macroscopic object, but the principle is useful in measuring the size of objects too small for direct measurements such as the atomic nucleus. Instead of a flashlight, we use a particle accelerator and a beam of electrons. The nuclear radius is then determined from the electron shadow, more commonly known as the electron scattering pattern. So although we usually associate a radius with a circle or a sphere, a rotating shape also has a radius. In this case, the radius is measured from the center of rotation to the tip of the propeller blade. Measuring the size of an irregular rotating object depends on the shape of the object and the manner of rotation. A stationary airplane propeller produces a smaller shadow at rest and a larger shadow when rotating. The three quarks of a proton are arranged in a linear alternating sequence, but exact quark positions are uncertain. Additionally, the proton is rotating in space, so the electron scatter pattern has fuzzy borders. Taking the root mean square of the electron charge density is a mathematical method of assigning an average value to this fuzzy border. The currently accepted RMS charge radius of the proton is 0.84 femtometers. For an irregular object such as a tablespoon, the manner of rotation plays a major role in determining the rotational radius. For example, a precessing tablespoon will have a smaller rotational axis than the same tablespoon tumbling about its center of mass. The way an object rotates determines its rotational radius. In the case of helium-3, a precessing rotation results in a rotational axis of 1.63 femtometers. This is much smaller than the accepted radius of 1.97 femtometers. However, a tumbling rotation results in a rotational radius of 1.97 femtometers, an exact match to the accepted value. For this reason, we predict a tumbling rotation for helium-3, wherein the radius is the distance from the center of mass to the farthest quark. Here are the alternating quark depictions of the nuclei of the first seven stable nuclides. The strength of the alternating quark model lies in its ability to predict these nuclear radii. The radius values currently accepted by the scientific community are shown here within a gray box. The radius values predicted by the geometry of simple alternating quarks are shown here within a red box. These alternating quark radius predictions demonstrate 97% agreement with accepted values within a standard deviation of less than 3%. Here is a statistical analysis of the alternating quark model compared with other ways of depicting the light atomic nucleus. On a scale where 1.0 represents perfect correlation, the alternating quark model rates a near-perfect 0.99. The most common depiction of the nucleus, with protons and neutrons as closely packed red and white spheres, correlates less strongly. And assuming the atomic nucleus is always a sphere, wherein the radius depends on the mass number A, demonstrates the weakest correlation. To summarize, the solution to the nuclear radius to mass number puzzle arises from the unique quark geometries of light nuclei and their highly variable radius predictions. And the erratic sawtooth pattern of radius to mass number is a direct result of these unique geometries. In the next section, we will show that the more predictable radii of larger nuclei are built upon a single geometry, the octadecagon of lithium-6. Nucleosynthesis created all the known elements from combinations of protons and neutrons. The process is thought to occur mainly in celestial objects such as quasars or neutron stars, and not all isotopes are stable. So here, we will focus only on the stable nuclides beginning with beryllium-9. The addition of a proton produces boron-10. 
an additional nucleon, in this case a neutron, produces the next stable nuclide, boron-11. In fact, the list of stable nuclides from beryllium-9 through silver-32 progresses one nucleon at a time. Whether a proton or a neutron will produce the next stable nuclide is a mystery. The alternating quark model predicts this incremental pattern. Nuclear stability is achieved when a nucleon added to an existing nuclide preserves the alternating quark sequence. Recall that the structures of the lighter nuclei assume simple geometries such as a line or a polygon, and that these multiple unique geometries are responsible for the erratic sawtooth pattern below lithium-7. In this section, we will show that the more linear pattern above beryllium-9 arises from a single geometry, the octadecagon base of lithium-6. Alternating quark structures predict nuclear stability. Starting with beryllium-9, the first 18 quarks comprise the lithium-6 base layer. The nine quarks of the parallel strand comprise a proton sandwiched between two neutrons. According to the model, the next type of nucleon added must connect directly to either end of the parallel strand in order to continue the alternating quark sequence. The addition of a neutron would produce two adjacent down quarks and would therefore disrupt the alternating sequence of quarks. This does not result in a stable nuclide. A proton, however, preserves the alternating quark sequence and creates a correlated pair with a neutron on the lithium-6 base. In turn, the structure of boron-10 predicts the next stable nuclide, boron-11. The second layer of boron-10 has an opening for either a proton or a neutron. The atomic nucleus has an overall positive charge, however. Since the proton also has a positive charge, an electrostatic or Coulomb barrier effectively screens the proton. But, as Chadwick discovered in 1932, the neutron is not impeded by the Coulomb barrier, as it has no overall charge, and thus boron-10 becomes boron-11. So in nucleosynthesis, nucleons add directly to the existing strand. The added nucleon must preserve the alternating quark pattern, and where an opening exists for either a proton or a neutron, the neutron is favored as it is not encumbered by the Coulomb barrier. Here is the sequence starting with boron-10, which has 12 quarks in its second layer. An additional neutron makes boron-11. The second strand now has a vacancy that can only be filled by a proton. This yields carbon-12 and fills the second layer. Since the first two layers are now filled, the next nucleon must now begin a third layer. This could either be a proton or neutron, but the Coulomb barrier screens the proton and favors the neutron. This produces carbon-13. Carbon-12 has two complete lithium-6 layers, and the next added nucleon will begin a third layer. Adding a proton requires overcoming the Coulomb barrier and produces unstable nitrogen-13. The preferred pathway results from adding a neutron to produce stable carbon-13. An additional neutron, however, disrupts the alternating quark sequence and produces unstable C14, whereas adding a proton perpetuates the linked quark sequence and produces stable nitrogen-14. A proton added to nitrogen-14 results in the unstable oxygen-15. This pathway is not favored, again, due to the Coulomb barrier. Adding a neutron, however, produces stable nitrogen-15. A further neutron disrupts the alternating quark sequence and results in unstable nitrogen-16, whereas adding a proton produces the stable oxygen-16. In all cases, nuclear stability requires perpetuating the alternating quark sequence and the addition of neutrons is generally favored over protons due to the repulsive Coulomb barrier. The distance between ring layers is determined by the double ring structure of carbon-12 shown here. According to the alternating quark model, the distance between rings is set to exactly 0.9616 femtometers when its nuclear radius equals the experimentally determined value of 2.4702 femtometers, and the distance between link quark equals the radius of the proton. The accepted radius of carbon-12 has the smallest uncertainty of the light nuclei. 
and the structure of carbon-12 exhibits perfect three-dimensional point symmetry. For these reasons, carbon-12 was selected as the standard for the distance between rings. Here. All of the following structures were determined using quarks. For the purpose of illustration, however, the nuclei will be shown here as equivalent protons and neutrons for the sake of clarity. Beginning with beryllium-9, quarks are added as nucleon equivalents one by one to assemble structural models for heavier nuclei through fluorine-19. Linearity above beryllium-9 derives from the incremental addition of nucleons to this common geometric base, as opposed to the various geometries that produce the sawtooth pattern of light nuclei. The alternating quark radius predictions resulting from these larger structures demonstrates 99% average agreement with accepted radii and a standard deviation of 1%. We've discussed the rationale for a quark sequence, but why an alternating quark sequence? The experimental charge distribution of the neutron has a positive core and a negative skin. This is consistent with the AQM model of a neutron rotating in space, which also has a positive core and a negative skin. Additionally, the Coulomb barrier and fusion potential curve actually arise from the difference in charge between up and down quarks. The up quark is opposite the charge of the down quark, and the charge of the up quark is twice the magnitude of the down quark. To see how this opposite and unequal charge physically generates the Coulomb potential barrier, let's review some basic electrostatics. Up and down quarks have opposite charge and will therefore attract. Two up quarks have the same charge and will therefore repel. This charge difference affects the fusion of deuteron and proton nuclei. The up quark charges present within each nuclei are larger than the down quark charges. Since like charges repel, the two nuclei will repel or push away from one another, and it will take energy to bring the nuclei together. This is called far-range repulsion. Here is a plot of the force between a deuteron fusing with a proton. This is also called the fusion potential curve. Repulsive force increases as the nuclei approach, arriving at a maximum. This maximum represents the amount of energy required to overcome the Coulomb barrier and achieve fusion. As the nuclei come ever closer, opposite quarks draw nearer one another and the predominant force at near range is attraction. Thus, an alternating sequence of quarks can account for far-range repulsion, near-range attraction, and the Coulomb potential barrier. Alternating and unequal quark charge also models neutron fusion. For example, a 6x3 mathematical array is configured between the 6 quark charges in a deuteron, and the three quark charges in a neutron. Coulomb's law is used to calculate individual quark-to-quark -quark forces, and the sum of the deuteron-neutron forces are plotted here. This shows near-range attraction, but no barrier. Conversely, deuteron-proton forces produce both near-range attraction and a potential barrier. Additionally, an alternating quark arrangement accurately predicts the potential barrier height. The usual way of calculating the Coulomb barrier assumes nucleon point charge distribution. An alternating quark potential barrier assumes quark point charge distribution. Nonetheless, the results of each calculation are very similar. Although the alternating quark model is primarily concerned with nuclear structure, a geometric arrangement of charge does produce a unique force. An array of alternating and unequal point charge, as shown in the deuteron, for example, interweaves a composite electrostatic force that contributes to retaining quarks within the nucleus. Electrostatic confinement describes this composite force between an individual quark and neighboring quarks. The result is a linear and increasing force-to-distance relationship, 
in sharp contrast to the rapidly decreasing inverse square curve typical of separating point charge. The electrostatic confinement resulting from an alternating quark sequence means that the farther a quark travels from the nucleus, the greater the total force pulling the quark back to the nucleus. Let's briefly review the evidence for alternating quarks presented thus far. A neutron comprising an alternating sequence of quarks explains its positive core and negative skin. AQM models the fusion curve for both the proton and the neutron. AQM accurately predicts the height of the Coulomb barrier and an alternating quark sequence generates a linear and increasing force that serves to confine quarks within the nucleus. The electric fields that interweave the quarks of fusing nuclei can be modeled on the human scale using the magnetic fields produced by ordinary magnets. Both electric fields and magnetic fields are described within the electromagnetic fundamental force. Although the electric fields are significantly stronger, both types of fields follow the inverse square law, so the relative force relationships between magnet arrays is analogous to the force relationship between fusing nuclei. Thus, appropriately configured magnet arrays can produce a potential barrier that behaves like the Coulomb barrier in nuclear fusion. Here, a six-magnet array may represent a deuteron, and a three-magnet array may represent a neutron or a proton. In these arrays, north magnets are configured to have twice the pull force of south magnets. As the arrays approach, the forces are palpable. The deuteron-neutron curve demonstrates near-range attraction, but no potential barrier, consistent with what we know about neutron fusion. Conversely, the deuteron-proton model yields both near-range attraction and a magnetic potential barrier. In the following illustrations, a magnet is depicted as an arrow pointing towards magnetic north. The analog of positive charge in our model is assigned the north magnetic pole while negative charge is assigned the south magnetic pole. The magnitude of the up quark is twice that of the down quark, shown in our magnet analog as a double magnet and single magnet, respectively. These magnetic contour maps were constructed by sampling the magnetic field at regular intervals between the deuteron and proton magnet analogs. They illustrate how the magnetic fields evolve and change as the arrays approach one another. Field strength is indicated by the color scale to the left. The double strength of north-facing magnets in the deuteron magnet model produces north magnetic predominance at far range. When the same deuteron magnet model now opposes a proton magnet model, a magnetic potential barrier forms between the arrays causing the arrays to repel one another. When sufficient force is applied to overcome this barrier, the proximity of opposite magnet poles results in a strong attractive force between the opposite poles. Thus, simple magnetic contour maps illustrate the nuclear fusion concepts of a potential barrier and near-range attraction. Additionally, the mathematical and magnetic models of an alternating quark sequence produce nearly identical potential curves. Both assume an inverse Leonard Jones shape. And note that the potential barrier is absent for the neutron model of each, again consistent with what we know about neutron fusion. Perhaps the greatest impediment to a quark model of the atomic nucleus is the uncertainty principle, which precludes localization of exact quark position. Expressed as uncertainty in energy and time, rather than position or momentum, may provide a path forward. Total quark energy may exist as an equilibrium between potential and kinetic energies, i.e., the quark may behave like a classical harmonic oscillator. A simple pendulum behaves as a classical harmonic oscillator. The oscillation and displacement from maximum to minimum is rhythmic and regular. 
and results from the interplay of opposing forces, in this case the centripetal force of the tether, opposing the force of gravity. Oscillation and displacement produces a concurrent oscillation between kinetic and potential energies. A simple harmonic oscillator, such as a single pendulum, follows a predictable path. A double pendulum is an example of a linked harmonic oscillator, and the resulting behavior is chaotic. Its path is unpredictable. This chaotic path is confined to a basin of stability, however. This basin of stability allows determination of an average position for the pendulum, even while exact positions at any time remain uncertain. In the alternating quark model, the nucleon likewise behaves as a linked harmonic oscillator. Exact quark positions and momenta are perpetually uncertain. This satisfies the uncertainty principle. Each quark travels within its own basin of stability, however, and within this basin the average quark position is knowable. By this reasoning, chaos theory, or nonlinear dynamics, provides the rationale for localizing average quark position within the alternating quark model. The various parameters and constraints of the alternating quark model have implications for the structure of the quark. Though nonlinear dynamics helps to rationalize average quark positions, serious questions remain. For example, the harmonic oscillation of the simple pendulum results from the interplay between the forces of gravity and the tether. But what forces are at play within a single quark? And if quarks are point charges, how do they maintain their distance? What difference in structure gives up and down quarks their unique charge? The smallest polygon quark structure is the dodecagon of helium-4. What is the role of quark structure in determining how much a sequence of quarks can bend? And what about the quark structure causes hydrogen-3 and helium-3 to assume their unique U shape? The answers to these questions depends on a deeper structure for quarks. Beta decay may provide a clue to quark structure. In this example, a neutron spontaneously emits a beta particle or high-speed electron to produce a proton. Perhaps it's not the entire neutron that emits the electron. Perhaps it's just one of its down quarks, which then becomes an up quark. This would mean that the structures of the down quark and up quark are similar, but differ by the presence or absence of an electron. Here is an artist's rendition of the quark as a classical harmonic oscillator. The yellow sphere is an electron, the red ring is an up quark, and the down quark is shown as an up quark that has captured an electron. This structure for quark satisfies the conjecture from beta decay that an up quark and down quark may differ by the presence or absence of an electron. The neutron is a series of three linked harmonic oscillators and will lose a labile electron through beta decay to become a proton. The red toroid carries a positive charge and is common to both the up quark and the down quark. So while the charge on the oscillating electron holds neighboring quarks together, the repulsion between the parallel adjacent red toroids will maintain the distance between quarks. The beta decay of tritium proceeds by a similar mechanism. Tritium also has two labile electrons at either end of its U-shaped quark sequence. The loss of either of these labile electrons through beta decay and the subsequent shift of the remaining electrons produces helium-3. The structure of tritium provides insight into the ring flex limitation of an alternating sequence of quarks. Tritium is flexed into a U-shape, which brings the toroid rings of neighboring quarks into close proximity. Further flexure would bring the edges of the neighboring toroids into closer proximity, resulting in even greater electrostatic repulsion. It is thus the repulsion of neighboring rings that limits the degree of flexion of an alternating quark sequence. The harmonic oscillation of tritium provides insight into its U-shaped structure. The labile electron is associated with a partial negative charge, while the other end of the U has a partial positive charge. 
these opposite charges result in attraction. With oscillation, the charge position changes, but the attraction is still there. Here is a summary. The number of quarks in a nuclide predicts its nuclear radius. Exact quark positions and momentum are unknowable, but average position lies within a knowable basin of attraction. The erratic radii of light nuclei through lithium-7 derive from the alternating quarks configured within simple geometries. The predictable radii above lithium-7 derive from the incremental addition of nucleons to a common lithium-6 base. Quark structures above lithium-7 predict the sequence of nucleosynthesis. Alternating polarity and unequal electromagnetic field strength give rise to a potential barrier. The alternating and unequal electrostatic quark charge sequences of opposing nuclides naturally generate a fusion potential curve, accounting for near-range attraction, the height of the Coulomb barrier, far-range repulsion, Nuclear fusion may be modeled from an alternating sequence of quarks arranged in a sequential array using Coulomb's law to calculate individual quark-to-quark -quark forces. Nuclear fusion may also be modeled from the magnetic fields produced by appropriately configured magnet arrays.